So it's it's my pleasure to um, be here today, and it's quite disturbing to me that I've been here enough times that I'm beginning to recognize faces uh, in the audience. And so thank you uh, for inviting me. And I want to apologize in advance that I may give for me an unusually boring lecture. So I'm trying to actually cover two bases, which is big data from the genomic. Uh, perspective a little bit, big data from the public health perspective a little bit, and big data from the clinical perspective a little bit. So that there'll be a little bit for everybody to like and enough for everybody to hate. And so I'm going to try to put this uh, in the in negative. What are the challenges uh, moving forward? And I hope <coughs> to illustrate the challenges by actually showing you some evidence of success. So this is a slide, a uh, figure, which actually will appear in a JAMA article soon, or this version of it. That was developed by one of my colleagues, uh, Griffin Weber. And I think it's a nice view of big data, and it's one that you, because it gives you a view that very other, very few other people have, which is look at all the different aspects of your life that are there, from medications, to encounters, to social history, to lifestyle, to your social network. An environment and look at how what a way we have of clinical to genomic data, trials data to observational data, structured data, unstructured data. That is one very large, one very large ecosystem. And I apologize to those who are on the WebEx apparently I need to stay close to the uh, So the real challenge is first of all, this is a highly heterogeneous set of uh, data. And, uh, and its real value is going to be in bringing it together. And I'll explain that shortly. And the challenges arise. In bringing it together. But the first challenge that um, I want to first articulate is the fundamental one, which is identifying the true names of disease. Um, Carolus Linnaeus was uh, one of the most successful uh, ontologists, those of you who are environmental informaticians, he created the modern cl the classification scheme, the binomial scheme, whereby everything has a first and a last name, the family name telling us, if you're a medicinal herb, what um, might be your similar properties, what might be your similar effects. And he was both a medicinal chemist, a medicinal herbalist, and a physician. And created, he was born about 305 years ago, and created a modern classification system that even today lives in some part of the IC9 coding system that we use today. For those of you who were up at last uh, last night, you'll be amused to know that we used to be called not Homo sapiens, but Homo diurnus, because before the uh, existence of modern electricity, uh, we actually stopped at night. And, um, but it's important to know that you, when, in this time, you could go to um, a patient and say, I uh, diagnose you with um, fever. Take this herb, or make the fever go down, and you say, Doctor, thank you. How much do I owe you? And you give the palm of flesh to the doctor. And we might think, hey, I see a few smiles. What a, what a, what a quaint practice it is. Because after all, fever is a symptom. Look at all our common diseases. What, what does uh, diabetes mellitus mean? Sweet urine. It's a symptom, it's not a cause. What is rheumatoid arthritis? Swelling inflammation of the joints. That's a symptom, not a cause. What is cancer? Proliferation of a little proliferation of tissues. It's a, it's a description of a of symptomatology, phenomenology, it's not a cause. And our treatments are treatments of the symptoms, not of the of cause. Our treatment of diabetes is what? To lower the blood sugar. Does that treat the underlying cause of diabetes? No. Our treatment of rheumatoid arthritis is to smash the immune system. Is that treating the cause? No. Our treatment of cancer is to stop the proliferation of cells. Is that treating the cause? No. What is the one area of medicine where the name of the disease is the cause of the disease? Infection. Who said that? You said that? Someone behind you said it, right? <laughs> 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 That's impressive. Give this sign. 
I, maybe it's only moment of genius, but I want to say that guy's really bright. Because I've asked this question maybe uh, 500 times, and the modal answer in a, in a modal response in, is incorrect in a room like this. So, yes, it's infection, remember. So the fact that Pasteur was able to identify the etiological agent of disease <coughs> led to, 100 years later, the effect of therapies that looked like magic, when you think about it. It created one of the few deaths in mortality that we can actually be proud about as doctors. The rest of the deaths in mortality, by and large, have been produced by uh, uh, better lifestyles, sanitation and uh, good food and so on. And so, if we're really going to treat these diseases effectively, we have to find out what their true names are. And my conceit, as a biomedical informatician, is that by smashing together these big data, we're able to triangulate exquisitely accurate place that these diseases lie to in fact find out what the true names are. So the challenge what first <coughs> out is that the clinical, clin class clinical trial business model is dead. Um, some big pharma still are running it and there are big pharma still <coughs> but they're like the beasts of yore that you know they're, they're shot in the head but their their nerves are so long that they uh, uh, realize that you have to run their body. But it's not just the, um, the pharma where um, it takes forever and billions of dollars to make their multiple trials. But NIH is telling us now they're no longer willing to uh, fund old school randomized clinical trials, whatever we believe their merit to be. And sometimes they're very many opponents, and sometimes they're misplaced. And we also know that um, the practice of medicine is now being effectively studied by some, for example, this study of um, thrombotic treatment in uh, myocardial infarction was incredibly influential, and it was basically done by having all the Italian ICUs to report on, on their treatment. And uh, similarly, a study uh, in uh, Scandinavia on, um, on uh, treatment of uh, uh, coronary disease was very effective by using a primary care network um, at $50 per patient, an unheard of cost. By the way, anybody have any, any idea how much quintiles, ch quintiles charges a pharma per average for a patient that they run from their clinical research organization? Any, any estimates per patient? How much? 5000 Where are you? 10000 10, Press right rules. 50000 Okay, and so when you have a fifth dose per patient, that's disruptive technology. And so at the same time that um, at the same time that um, we were beginning to use observational studies, a group of individuals that I had the honor of participating in their deliberations at the Institute of Medicine came up with a report on precision medicine. And this report made the following point, which is that. If you look at our biomedical discovery work, most of it has happened, whether in academia or in, in, in academia or in industry, has been here on the left, going from basic science to target identification using important mechanistic studies, which is actually very, very honorable. Yet, the part on the right, we have paid very little attention to, looking at uh, retaxonomizing disease, using both clinical data, observational studies of clinical data enriched by molecular characterization and using the same metaphor that we got from Google Maps where Google and let's say Google Earth layers on different views of the same XY coordinates in that case being longitude and latitude. We want to take these information columns where we lay on top from the exposome to the genome to uh, microbiome all these different characteristics of the individual so that we can actually um, infer perhaps some new insights using this underused data. After all, medical care is really expensive. It makes no sense that we invest all this effort and time and money in medical care and not use it as a source of data. So there's, fair, there's several limitations, some of which I'll touch upon more uh, in the next coming back. One is electronic health records are limited in a variety of ways. And one is just that they only capture uh, a little bit of the patient state. They um, 
observational studies are a perceived burden uh, if you have to provide additional documentation. Doctors and nurses are already overworked. Often articulated are privacy concerns. We can't share these data for broader use in big data because these are patient private data. And often a more honest um, accounting of, these, of this reluctance to share is that institutions feel uh, competitive with one another and feel very concerned that revealing of what's going on in their patient population might provide a competitive advantage to another institution. And then there's also a lot of regulatory overhead in sharing uh, such data. And finally, uh, it's nice to say that we're creating information commons. The fact is, right now, our infrastructure is poorly architected to join omic data with clinical data. Your epic electronic health record system, for example, is not going to uh, easily accommodate whole genome uh, annotation at this time. So one aspect of this challenge is how are we going to just join all those data together? support integration. And the fact is, we do not, some countries have a universal health identifier. This country does not, is unlikely, for the same reason we will always believe we have the right to uh, bear uh, semi-automatic assault rifles, we will not also um, uh, have a universal health identifier. But in fairness, there are many aspects of this big data picture that are not in the healthcare space, whether it's your Twitter feeds or pollen count in your region, they actually don't have identi identity. So what we will find increasingly is that whether it is either clinical data or non-clinical data, we are going to have to resort to a, and this is a challenge, to a number of probabilistic techniques <coughs> to find the matching patient, <coughs> the same patients or the same populations across the healthcare system. And that's a, it's a doable challenge, but it's actually a serious complicated challenge. Um, I'm not going to focus, for the first part of my talk, on the clinical uh, data, the data that we obtain during the course of care um, that is both structured data, labs, meds, diagnoses, immunizations, demographics, and unstructured data, the clinical notes. And I just want to make an uh, important point just to get, rid of it, to get rid of this discussion point, which is often when I talk to non-medical researchers, they say, why can't you have doctors just enter structured data always? And the answer is, they're too darn busy. And anybody who's ever tried to get a, to themselves enter a 400 item form on the web will know that it takes forever, and you're not going to get a doctor to do that in a 10 minute uh, visit. And so what happens is we get these big narrative dictated text blobs we have to use natural language processing techniques to uh, get the content out of it, but it's quite doable. And we've actually created toolkits that allow you to extract from the healthcare system these large um, uh, data sets from electronic health records. It's called I2B2, Informatics for Integrating uh, Biology in the Bedside, and it was a result of a, a common fund grant. And now this toolkit has actually been adopted by over 100 academic health centers um, in covering. This is already out of date, but covering the United States, Europe, some sites in China, and is being used also for pre competitive data sharing by over five pharma and several other consortia in Europe. And so, what does I2B2 look, look like? So, for example, this is work done by Robert Plenge, where he looks at um, a patient, um, a patient, uh, patient set selected by dragging and dropping different characteristics of patients into these boxes, which allows them to do and or Boolean combinations of characteristics. In this case, it's rheumatoid arthritis. That's nothing really uh, too remarkable, except to show, say, that this works for databases with millions of patients, with billions of rows, and for a single patient, it shows you, these hash marks show you um, when there were different ACR criteria met, medications were, were given, and if you click on this, if this was a, a live uh, screen, it actually shows the full note from what's its case. And importantly, the data that, underlie, that underlies this is both from the codified data stream that I told you about, and codified, na codified narrative text, natural language process text. And the important point here is that if you 
just look at billing data, which is what most people do today. It's incredibly biased for um, maximization of income. And if you were to look, for example, at rheumatoid arthritis, most of our large hospitals <coughs> have about twice as much rheumatoid arthritis as they have half as much rheumatoid arthritis as they claim to. Because a, room, a radiologist, when they get an x ray and it says rule out rheumatoid arthritis, if they bill it as normal, they get no money. If they bill it as rheumatoid arthritis, they get some money. And so we found through natural language processing that half the cases of rheumatoid arthritis were not rheumatoid arthritis. And there's ways to link this to the actual patient samples that are discovered during the course of care. I only showed this study done by, again by Rob Plange and Kat Leal to make the following point. This is a standard uh, genome-wide association study and shown on the x-axis, x-axis as usual is uh, six, on the y-axis the odds ratio, and the point here is that a previous study done several million, million dollars over several years, shown in um, light blue, was reproduced by us using the electronic health record phenotyping, which took <coughs> just days to do, and we accumulated the samples just in a few months, and we were able to execute the whole uh, GWAS in literally 1% of the time and a tenth of the cost, upper bound. And so that's really a disruptive measure of what you can do, and this explains probably why you see now deals being made between healthcare systems such as um, Pennsylvania, Geisinger, and uh, Regeneron, where <coughs> they're making these kinds of deals, where they're going to use electronic health record in this way to do this kind of matching. Now, ITB2 is very useful for getting data out of electronic health records of various stripes, ethics, surveillance, and so on. But it does not get over that, that bubble cloud I had before about institutional competitiveness. And the closer you are to one another, the more you hate each other. And so Harvard loves collaborating with UCSF. But Harvard hospitals hate collaborating with each other. And so when I propose as part of our clinical translational science award that our main hospital should actually share data uh, for the purposes of translational research, I had a month, uh, several, and particularly one very furious senior vice president who was yelling to me about how we, we were going to allow them to cherry pick or report bad outcomes in their in their hospital. And so what we did is we created something called Shrine, the Shared Health, Shared Health Research Informatics Network which is a distributed query system. So no one ever, there's no central database ever created. And what happens instead is that you can query across the network with the right IRB and the right governance. And you can find this, uh, various populations of interest without ever creating a central database. And if everybody, anybody gets unhappy, they can switch off their participation and go home with their marbles, with their data. And this has been very appealing, and it's been picked up by a lot of different networks, including, for example, the whole University of California uh, system, which are using it for their UC Rex system. And just, but just at Harvard, I want to point out that we have 6 million patients and 10 million facts. Yet we, after we've got all these ordinary hospitals to come together. And that allows us, of course, to find small effects, small effects of common diseases, but also allows us to find rare diseases. So being the narcissist that I am, I have a, a Google alert every time someone cites a paper that I write. And so we had written a very small paper describing this Schwein network. So I was very pleased also to see a major paper that was citing our Schwein network. And what was it? So this is very rare event that kills women in their third trimester of pregnancy um, called peripartum cardiomyopathy. Myopathy was totally understood. And a group of investigators at the Beth Israel had um, in Boston had um, some pretty good mechanistic ideas and actually had demonstrated to their satisfaction on a small number of patients at Beth as well, but not enough to convince editors or reviewers. And so they actually used a shrine system to go from one handful of patients to four handful of patients on this rare disease, and they were able to do it. So they could, and they did this without my knowledge, which is ideal. And they were able to use the system to accelerate from not slow to fast, from impossible to just getting it done in a few months. And think about how you are empowered if you have this same kind of system available across not just one healthcare system, but multiple healthcare systems. <coughs> I want to show you this genetics 101 uh, equation. The variance of the phenotype equals the variance of the genotype plus the 
variance of the environment, plus the variance due to the genetic environment uh, interaction. And the reason I want to show you that slide, that equation, is because counterintuitively, we've gotten very good at estimating the genomic variance because the genomic cowboys and cowgirls have done a great job in getting cheap, good tools to measure genetic variance. But we have very poor tools to measure the variance in the environment. And frankly, we have very poor tools of um, characterizing the phenotype. Our phenotypes are very superficial, like in autism. Autism, yes. Autism, no. If we believe it to be multiple diseases, that's pretty unsatisfactory. And so if you don't have E and P, well, for example, you can imagine G and E are also not relevant for that. So paradoxically, if we really want to understand the medically relevant thing, V, P, V sub P, we better get a lot better at the, uh, the environmental characterization and the phenotypic characterization. So let me tell you a quick story about that. And by the way, when I was a senior resident, I always got my team to breakfast before any other team. I want to make sure that I end on time, A, to get me out the door, and B, so you can ask, ask some questions. So in 2012, Lee Nadler, had, uh, who runs our CTSA, had $300,000 of supplemental CTSA funds. And he asked me if I could do anything interesting with that. I said, why don't I try to quickly generate an ad hoc network, which we did, across seven sites. And we asked questions around autism and type 2 diabetes. I'm just going to summarize the autism part. Out of glass. 13, almost 14,000 patients represented in that uh, biased sample of half percent of the possible population, male to female, five to one, representing 5,000 diagnoses, lab peer measurements of 3 million falling into 3,581 lab types, and lots and lots of uh, men. And the first paper we wrote just to show uh, some things that were quite expected such as the fact that there was a, a lot of seizures in autism, that we also saw that there was more controversial, a lot of bowel disorders, and that um, we also saw that there was a lot of, um, if, that, if you had muscular dystrophy, 5% of you would have autism, so, which is interesting because the stroke thing was expressed in the brain. So 5% of people with muscular dystrophy we were able to show that there was increased uh, incidence of tenfold of schizophrenia, of the uh, general population, of uh, type 1 diabetes, and um, of inflammatory bowel disease. When I presented this to developmental pediatricians, they dismissed it, because, and there was a reason, reason why. Even if they were very busy and they had seen a thousand kids with autism, they'd only seen 10 of these kids. And so uh, over a lifetime, 10 kids with inflammatory bowel disease not register as a common pattern. But here it pops out. Furthermore, these um, morbid comorbidities were incredibly and surprisingly reproducible across multiple hospitals. You'd think that Wake Forest, which is in the middle of the, of the country somewhere, I'm from Switzerland, so I don't even know where it is, um, and, and Boston would, uh, would have different uh, Different populations, different uh, physicians would have very different comorbidities, especially if these are all ascertainment bias, but they don't. And I heard that one of my postdocs, Finale, came and gave you a talk, but I think she came to the computer science department, is that yeah. right? Yeah. So most of you did not hear it. So what she did was very, very clever. What she did is she blocked the, the patients, since we have longitudinal data, after all, it's a, it's a healthcare record. It's not a simple case control study. Where you say what's well, not autism. Well, Here you have the full 50 minute row of patients from since birth. She divides it into six month blocks, and for each six month block, she says, which of the 5,000 diagnoses does that patient have in the six month block? And then what she does is she says, let's cluster these patients. Let's find out which patients are the most similar. Now, because this was only done with billing data, not with natural language process data, there were, was two, there were two results. First of all, there was one big unresolvable bag of patients that we couldn't resolve that had everything. But then there were three very distinct subgroups based on this comorbidity pattern. So one group, this is the, the cumulative incidence, had a lot of persistent development disorders, but a lot of epilepsy and cerebral palsy. And I want to point out that in, although 
if it was randomly scattered, you see about 20% um, epilepsy losses. This subgroup had 80% epilepsy. And they did not bleed into this other group, the second cluster, shown in blue, which had a Titus media, ear infections, they had um, viral and chlamydial infections, and also, um, not shown here, had inflammatory bowel disease. So a lot of infections and autoimmune disease in a second cluster, not um, uh, seizures. And a third group, shown in um, green, had a lot of anxiety, hyperkinetic syndrome, the old IC9 term for ADHD, and uh, they, and also schizophrenia. And so this looks, so we have three clusters now. We have a seizure cluster, we have a infection, autoimmune uh, cluster, and we have a psychiatric cluster. And that's very important because you can imagine the following. If I did a GWAS on heart failure, and I included all the patients who had right or left-sided heart failure, gunshot wounds to the heart, viral myocarditis, uh, genetic, and put it into one, into one bin, I would have to have one huge uh, population in order to be able to find any signal. And so therefore, it's not that surprising that autism, which is as heterogeneous as, you, as we believe it to be from genetic studies, has not really yielded that much on um, the genome-wide association studies. But now having found the subgroups, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about genotype first, I'm going to argue phenotype first. Because if we actually define much more deeply the, the physiology and the clinical trajectory of our patients, we're going to identify individuals who have different underlying biology. The person who bleeds out from that heart wound, from the hole in the chest, is different from the person who shows up with cardiomyopathy, which is different from the person who gets a heart attack at age 60. And in similar ways, if we look at the, the comorbidities, that actually we're not studied very much, the medical comorbidities, we're not studied very much by the, by the uh, clinical community, I think we're going to be able to find, over time, these genetically uh, distinct subgroups. And I just want to tell you that I was asked by the Simons Foundation to put a three-paragraph description on the study on this website. And what was amazing to me, three, three, uh, one week later, uh, they told me to go back to the site because there was so much parental comments saying, how come for the first time someone's acknowledging what I need to be true about my kid? Because you know the, 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 uh, the gastrointestinal problems were dismissed as tummy aches. I mean, all these other things were not seen holistically by the... Uh, biological pediatricians, but very much uh, uh, in the forefront of the mind of the parents. So using I2B2, uh, we've been thinking about how can we bring together all our scattered assets in various disease areas, and I'm going to use autism as just an example, to actually bring together data. So for, I've been now, thanks to Lenny Rockmore, who runs a developmental center, studying autism for at least uh, eight years. And we've developed a lot of data, but I could never ask the question, what are the, who are the patients who are upregulated in this gene, who have SNPs in that gene, and have the following API, ADOS score, and have, uh, for which we have some blood available. And so a uh, man by the name of Paul Avia, who was implemented i 2 b 2 in his uh, hospital in Paris, came to do a postdoc with us, and he did such a great job, he cut to the chase, we offered him a community effect. And what he did is he used I2B2 to bring all this data together, all the Simons data, all the clinical phenotyping done at the research um, grade, all the phenotype data obtained from electronic health record, all the SNP studies, the exome studies, the RNAC, and matching them all up so that we can now, in an I2B2 uh, uh, setting, ask, just as I was dragging and dropping before for um, rheumatoid arthritis, we can actually look at all these patients. Uh, for which we have uh, some information, and we can ask for which patients uh, have epilepsy, uh, which patients uh, don't, and we can do simple and descriptive statistics before going further, and we can look at um, their age characteristics, whether they're homozygous, um, and in the, if they're homozygous in a particular uh, gene, and so on. And we can now do these queries in real time across this population, something that 2014, I think any clinical or genomic researcher should be expected to be able to do. Um, 
So that's a challenge. Smashing the data together is a challenge, but I think it's just a matter of political will. Next challenge is secure environment. I'm actually very, I, I tend to be not very sympathetic to people who worry about privacy, because I think we actually do protect the privacy of our patients. And a study recently showed that, from I think JAMA, or JAMA Internal Medicine, that patients are much more worried about their data being shared for billing purposes or for public health than they are for research. But ironically, the only thing we get IRB oversight for is the research use, where the data gets spread for every other mode. But I am actually more sensitive about data security. Forgive me for the IS folks who are here, but our data safety practices in most of the hospitals are much, much more primitive than the highest level of practices of cloud computing. So one of our, my colleagues is um, um, at Harvard at the Center of Biomedical Informatics is Eric Paraxis, who used to be the chief information officer of uh, the FDA, and before that, a um, executive in J&J. And back in 2007, he actually took all the J&J data and put it in Amazon Cloud, which initially gave everybody the heebie-jeebies, because after all, this was private corporate data. But then when he had his security officers actually look point by point about the security that was in the Amazon Cloud, which has the benefits of scale, with that, that which was available um, locally, they all agreed that um, the Amazon Cloud was much more um, secure. And in fact, you all heard about the target uh, breach. That was, not, that was in their own private database. Because again, just like a hospital, they thought, mm -hmm. it's our data will be the one secure. But the more, the less scale you have, the less attention you can pay to security practices and be aware of all the amazingly interesting malicious attempts to hack into our databases. And you're going to see headlines over the next two or three years, I predict, that's going to make the, um, unless they, they pay off the blackmail money, that's going to make the um, target uh, experiences look quite minor. So I think we actually do have an issue of hosting data. That's one that's made more acute by the fact that our data requirements are growing so so large in the um, genomic space and in the clinical space that's not clear that we can afford it to maintain locally, and yet it's not clear that clinical leadership yet has made the acknowledgement that they have to figure out how to pay for cloud-hosted options out of uh, operating budget rather than buying hardware and having depreciated it over a few years. There's another challenge uh, to uh, to big data, and that's institutional technology. With my friend Ken Mandel, I wrote uh, an article back in 2009 when we saw all the Obamacare uh, investment, multi-billion dollar bribery of uh, hospitals to adopt electronic health record systems. We were very worried about it because we were very worried that there was going to be, since it was a requirement for, no, for everything to be shovel ready, so to speak, that these systems could be purchased immediately because each doctor was going to get $44,000 um, to adopt the electronic health record, that the system would have to be available. If you look at most of the existing systems, they are not the descendants. They are using essentially the same code base that my dear colleague, Octo Barnett, developed in 1969. It's a MUMPS database, and a MUMPS operating system, and a MUMPS application language. And that's what's running Epic, and that's what's running uh, Meditech, and so these huge systems are running on 1970s technologies. And that in itself is not intrinsically bad. But because of the way these things are governed corporately, as we said in this article, we do not have the same facility as we have an iPhone. Where I don't like my to-do list application. I download another one. And I don't go over to Apple and say, I'll pay you $100,000 to uh, install a new to-do application. No, I just go to the App Store, click. And, and download. And so we said, why couldn't healthcare IT be more like the iPhone? But of course, the ability for someone else to innovate is not given. All your list, all you're left with is the vendor saying, we'll do this in the future, or if you pay us enough money, we'll do some custom consulting for you today. So we've actually proposed something. Uh, the Office of the National Coordinator gave us a nice grant. Uh, and we proposed something called the Smart Platform after we uh, wrote that uh, paper, where we basically said, we're going to create the App Store for healthcare. And um, the vocabulary we use is we have data sources, which are managed by containers. Containers present data sources in the same way to all apps. So if you're, if you're an app or application, 
you, you see this data in the same way, you can call for it in the same way, no matter what the underlying system. To give you a sense of how it works, so we, this started three years ago. Um, we took a um, very nice um, piece of uh, technology um, from Wired Magazine. The technology was a piece of paper. They showed how a, they had a contest, a design contest, that only resulted in paper. How should the cardiology results look like on the electronic health record? And so Wired Magazine had this contest run by uh, David McCandless. And he thankfully issued that as a um, common, uh, Creative Commons license. So what we did is we took that design one developer in one week, created a smart application, and ran it on multiple platforms. So we had literally that actual application running on the multiplicity of electronic medical records. At Children's Hospital Boston, it's really important, as it is here, to take care of kids who have blood pressure problems. If they have renal artery disease, or they have a lipid disease, or they have an endocrine disease, it's important to take care of their blood pressure. But guess what? Blood pressure grows like everything else in the child. <coughs> and after many, many decades, pediatrics has growth charts, right? And so we know how to plot the kids' height and weight. But guess what? We don't have blood pressure charts in the electronic health record. So they were finding in these clinics that when they see a blood pressure, they wouldn't know if it's low or high. Previously, they had plotted on some normograms that they had in paper, but they no longer could do it. So, our CIO, who was actually one of my former students, had said to our electronic health record vendor, Could you please create this functionality? They said, It's a top of the list. And, I, and all the division heads said to my former colleague, put to my colleague, Could you put this on top of the list? And they did. And for three years, nothing happened. <laughs> in three months, we got this app, which looks, which reports blood pressure centile, running natively in clinical production within our hospital against the full production EMR. And it's used routinely by cardiology, renal, and endocrine clinics. Production. Showing you, but here's, I want you to understand the process. What it means is someone from outside the vendor has some expertise, packages it, and through a safe application interface that has been proven to be secure, is able to, to access the data and provide enough additional data to make a job that was before impossible to onerous possible. We are also, we've also implemented a smart genomics API. So I have no idea when uh, Cerner or uh, Epic is going to show you SNP arrays, but we can actually now, in smart application, go get both against your, let's say, 23andMe data repository and your electronic health record and show one place a combined uh, uh, view. Frankly, I was a little bit pessimistic about this project because for many good reasons, these vendors have a great gig and they, they, they actually are resisting, they're resisting these kind of technologies which would, which would disrupt their monolithic business model. But I was very pleased I was not there, but some of my colleagues were at this huge uh, boondoggle called HIMSS. HIMSS is a uh, yearly vendor meeting for health information technology. And apparently, all those booths that you just uh, highlighted here demonstrated smart apps that we had written running natively against their products. And I had nothing to do with it. And these are pictures uh, of some of my colleagues who are going around to these booths and are pretty happy to see all our different apps running. But it's beginning to happen. I don't know if some uh, empire will strike back and squish this, but right now, we actually have real apps running against real operating uh, electronic health workers uh, around the country. Um, and so we actually have the ability to allow innovation to happen outside the narrow vendor community, to allow smart computer scientists to at least provide apps. They don't have to be adopted, but this can be considered for adoption if they are useful and safe. So now I want to go to the other part of the diagram, the part of the diagram that is outside the healthcare system. 
And although it looks like only a third of the diagram is outside the healthcare system, in a good life, much less than 1% of your time is spent outside the healthcare system. And so therefore, um, most of your gain is outside the healthcare system. So just as it, it, it's somewhat laughable that we try to manage blood pressure by measuring blood, uh, something that varies from second to second by measuring once every three months, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge to figure out how we can actually harness all that data outside the healthcare system. Answer number one, leverage families. In pediatrics, and I'm aware that not all of you are pediatricians, but I can say proudly as a card, card, uh, card carrying pediatrician, that families are really good at providing data. And so we were able, able to show, for example, that in that incredibly exciting time that patients spend waiting to be seen in the emergency room in our August institution, the parents can actually fill out the medication form and be more accurate than either the doctor or the nurse in terms of what medications the patients are on. So you can say medication is okay, maybe. But we were able to show in another study, which I don't think I cite here. Oh yeah, we were able to, the parents using a standard algorithm could estimate hydration status of the baby better than, than the clinicians. Because the clinician is, looks at the kid, the heart rate, blah, blah, blah. The parents are crying, blah, and they, they know a lot more about their kid. And so figuring out how to harness that is absolutely essential to the Next challenge, return of research results. Personally, I believe that the, um, the distinction between research results and clinical results are becoming increasingly arbitrary. Let me give you a thought experiment. You've been a study of pregnancy. Uh, let's screen for T. Sachs disease. You see trisomy 21 on the amniocentesis. thesis. Do you report it or not? It's a research protocol. Do you report it or not? You see, I see someone shaking your head, and someone said you have to. Well, that's what represents the state of art. So they actually wrote the protocol so they didn't have to. Guess what? They got sued. And you know what? I would have been, I don't like lawsuits, but I would have been, if I had been a parent and I had a kid who had tri 721 and you didn't tell me about this, but you had done the amniocentesis and you knew about it, I'd be pretty upset. So, fast forward, there's a, a world called 2014 where we can do whole genome sequencing for $1,000. Let's say you enroll a child in a whole genome sequence. And I can find a pathognomonic sign in is going to have uh, pediatric leukemia. A lot of protocols right now are written so that you cannot actually uh, share that with, uh, with the patient. Is that responsible? I don't know. But if, if, if people want to say they're not responsible, you know why? Because they can't imagine how they go about A, scanning the genome, B, reporting it. But that for me is just an information processing and information handling problem. And I think we have to grow up and recognize that if we're going to do these kinds of tests, we just have to start becoming responsible for them. It's, otherwise, it's absolutely equal to, in my opinion, to the uh, trisomy example, for which there was a successful lawsuit. All right, so we're going to do genomic studies. The Connect is going to be following you around the room. Your skill and your uh, Fitbit are measuring you. Uh, if you're Japanese, you really like measuring what comes out of to uh, your toilet. I kid you not. Um, you have uh, cameras all around you, Fitbits, ex exercise, um, and uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm, the big phone company chipset manufacturer, is, has a, a $50 billion business that's banking on there being a billion dollar business around instrumenting the home. And I then go back up the envelope calculation, which informs me, informs me that the amount of data coming from a single home will exceed in two years what an ICU bed had come in, up, 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 out of it. That has a bit of an implication because what do we have here? Two ICU beds, a nurse. So the challenge of having this quantified outside medicine into medical care, so stuff that's measured outside medicine, the 99% outside medicine, and bring it to medical care is who's going to staff it? Are we going to have a nurse for every two patients? Interesting full-time employment act to watch all the, watch all that data for um, all for something interesting. Either that's going to happen, or we're going to have to get much, much better algorithms to look at that data and trust them a lot more than we're willing to trust any algorithms in the ICU today. And what are the risks? And more importantly, this is going to be a business. Who's going to pay? And who's going to do it? Is it going to be a health 
healthcare business, that CHOP, Charles Boston run, or it's going to be separate, separate businesses that say, you guys are dinosaurs, we're going to figure out how to run that business with Qualcomm and figure out how to give you a small piece of the action. That's a big threat, perhaps, if our business is actually taking care of our patients' big data. What about the environment? Very tough. Here's a study done by one of my recent acquisitions, which I stole from one of my former students, a cool piece. Um, Chirag did this very nice uh, EWAS, or Environmental Wide Associate Study, where he looked at the NHANES data, where they have thousands of individuals, and they've measured the mass spec of a lot of biochemicals. Some of the biochemicals have come from pesticides, some of the biochemicals have come from dietary supplements. And when you do a GWAS, remember you, you take a condition like diabetes versus not diabetes, and you say one of the steps that are in, in, have a high odds ratio that's improbable. So he did this very same thing and he validated on a second uh, data set on EWAS. And you see here hepatochloric epoxide and PCBs, which are nasty things that come, I think, from uh, fertilizer. No, that's right, uh, pesticides. And, and they have positive odds ratios. And then you have protective uh, odds ratios on type diabetes on these vitamin metabolites. Pretty interesting and reproducible. And given the fact that most of our common diseases have heritabilities on approximately 50 to 60 percent, it suggests a whole new set of information uh, that we can now get on our individuals. But are we measuring this routinely on patients? No. Are we going to measure genomics? More likely. But why is that? It's just because we have not engineered environmental wide assessments the way we've engineered the genome. Next cha challenge public health, action, and governance. So here's a study that was done by my colleagues uh, Rice, Ramstein, and Mandel. And like many, they saw uh, that there was this period, periodicity of, this is, these are years on the, on the x-axis, periodicity of in, uh, influenza-like illness. And so but what was interesting, when I looked at the look cancer <coughs> like them, I noticed, hmm, when people, uh, when kids start sneezing at children's hospital, then only two weeks later, they start coughing at Beth Israel and MGH. And that's the time that the, influenza, you know, the CDC is aware of it. And the mortality happens about peak four weeks after the kids start sneezing and coughing. So what is that? Detailed um, analysis is, it's the three-year-olds. The three-year-olds are the leading edge of the, uh, of the epidemic who basically go to that middle-class cesspool called daycare, come home, a lot of the viruses to be combined, something deadly happens, they bring it home, and they could kill granddad. And this is actually well known to, to the Japanese, who in the 1980s did a study where they showed that vaccination of three-year-olds prevents death in, um, in older people. We didn't know that, and when they, shortly after our study came out, the proposed vaccination guidelines which went down from five to three years of age. The question of, so, it's not so much I'm trying to tell you people can do with big data. The question I have is the governments. What makes us look at data and ask the important question? We were killing people all the time by, by not giving them data uh, in an effective way. I want to be even more pointed. Uh, Gavin has seen this uh, slide a million times, but I'm going to make a different point here. So this is our fine hospitals in Boston, and this, uh, you, would, you would give me a standard ovation maybe to show that I reduced the um, incidence of myocardial infarction in Boston by 2%. But instead, I'm showing you that over this period from 2000 to 2000. Uh, five, we had a peak up to 16-17% uh, increase in heart attacks. Observation number one, no one was aware of it. Can you imagine that there's this huge epidemic of heart attacks and no one is aware of it? In first-rate hospitals? Anybody want to take a wild guess what those arrows are? Ah, I already showed part of it. So it's vibes coming in and vibes coming out. And the correlation between the exposure of bikes is there. And if you case control the actual patients, it's the bikes exposure. So not only was there an epidemic that we were unaware of, but we were actually causing the epidemic. And the sad thing is some, some weirdos like um, Garrett had written some stuff early on saying, you've got a problem. Pah, literature, what's that? We, don't, we didn't read it. And except for perhaps Kaiser Permanente, which took it off formulary, the rest of us kept on prescribing this drug. Governance issue. Who 
do today, we could be doing this again with some other drug, and we would not know it. And the data is available through ITV2 and other such techniques. What is what's it going to take in terms of governance to start looking at our data to find out the basic thing? It's, it's as if uh, I said, oh, uh, oh, 2014, uh, oh, a bunch of planes crashed, but we, we don't know why. Oh, yeah, it was because this part fell off and that part fell off. Let's go fix our plane. As opposed to what the FAA really does for every case, it says, what went wrong? Does an analysis and say, let's fix this part of the plane. We have nothing like that in medicine, and we can think of ourselves as the caring profession. More. So I grew up in Geneva, Switzerland, and I assumed that the WHO would have the DEFCON 3 room, command room, Queens everywhere, Bangladesh, you know, America, sending the troops to uh, get Ebola there. And nothing. They had this mix of people calling them and saying, I'm worried about this. So my colleague, uh, John Brownstein, wrote a program called which just reads in several languages, 60,000 articles a day, Russian, Chinese, Arabic, French, you name it. And then just the simple thing it says, was there an infectious disease? Where did it happen? And when did it happen? And it does it pretty darn well, so that the WHO and the CTC now use this as a main tracking tool. And what covers a lot of different diseases, and you know, they were able to show they were able to track back from an index case of H1N1 in Mexico, which was actually reported in the news, but no one, of course, was who was over in the English speaking world was, was reading the Spanish paper. And also, you know, back in this was 2009, um, John made an app called, um, I think, uh, I Health Map Outlet. I, I think it's not called Food Near You. Food Near You. And what he found was the following. This thing was uh, uh, downloaded tens of thousands of times. And here's an interesting graph. This is a graph over 2009, and the report of influenza. Two graphs. One is going to be the graph of uh, the CDC reporting influenza, and this graph from the iPhone. And what's amazing about it is two things. One, they look, the curves look the same. Two, the data from the iPhone comes in two weeks before the CDC because it doesn't have to go through a bureaucratic layer. And as, as opposed to Google Trends, which just says, let's see what people are searching for, which is just actually magnifying the law. I mean, it's, it's related in some way to the incidents, but it's, it's magnified through the law. And in fact, on last year, it did not track them. Well, these are people actually reporting symptomatology. This worked very, very well, and you only need a few thousand sentinels to actually report very, very well. And one of the final challenges is who? Who's going to do this big data integration? Are we going to have to develop a much larger cohort of uh, nerds, I mean biomedical quants? <laughs> like me. um, are we going to have to develop biomedical information infrastructure teams? Are this coming in or outside the healthcare system? I think there are some insights that we can have on genomics. So, quick, uh, I will get you out on time, don't worry, four more minutes. So, quick question. Study done in the Netherlands, 2003. Primary care practitioners. You're asked, primary care practitioner, did you order a genetic test for cancer susceptibility? What percentage of the of the PCPs, the primary care provider, said, yes, I did order such a test? Three percent. Press the right rules again. Three percent. Come on, be a little bit braver. Nine zero. Nine zero. Okay, well, at least people know how the game play. Any other bits? <laughs> Okay, the modal answer for August audience, I've answered, asked this question maybe a thousand times. So the modal answer in, in August to the clinical audience is 1%. The actual answer is 30%. Hmm. Okay. And if you were a medical student, still, you remember, you understand the game of it, you're gone high. Anyway, <laughs> it's always counterintuitive when someone asks you a question like that. So, so then the next question is why did they order that? I don't have time to torture you socratically to think about the real reason they ordered the real reason they ordered is because the patients asked them for the test. The patient Google, they found history of breast cancer, please order the test. Guess what? They all ordered when the patient asked. Furthermore, separate study, are the doctors comfortable uh, uh, 
interpreting that test when they get the results back? No. Second uh, study, are they confident? No. Third study, by the CDC, you said attractive men and women to tell you well, how great that test is. It's called in the medical East, detail, doctor. Four cities increased uh, the ordering by a factor of four, by saying doctors who feel both uncomfortable, uncomfortable and incompetent to interpret the test. <laughs> so, only reason you can get away with seeing this is because doctors don't have any pride yet about genome tests. If I said this about heart attacks, it would be a much tougher road to, uh, to hope. But in fact, we don't have much bio, uh, biomedical reforms in medicine. And so it's really practical who's going to do this. And genomics, I think, it just shows us how weak our underbelly is in terms of quants. So I told you about I2B2. This is what it really takes to get I2B2 going. We meet every week. There's the architect IT leader who also happens to run all of research IT board partners. There's an expert who understands that particular database and understands all the skeletons in the closet. Like, that clinic sucks. This lab changed its, its, uh, its measuring measurements for glucose in 2011. So that's why we're seeing this change. We have an NLP expert. Uh, we have our respected leader and regulatory expert. She's a former uh, dean of the medical school, of uh, research for medical school. There's a clinical champion of genetics, Rob Plange. And it's so hard to hold on to these people. This guy now heads uh, genetics at uh, Merck. That's how hard it is. Then we have an epidemiologist clinician. We have a vision flogger and cheerleader. We have a biostats person. We have some of a phenotyping clinical researcher. And as well, uh, we have a bench researcher. And we have a necessary days nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and taking the photograph is my former thesis advisor, who I keep around, Peter Solovich, who's a computer scientist and photographer. So this group meets every week. And the most important thing that happens is you A, understand it's important, and B, you learn to speak each other's language. In the last 60 seconds, where is the expertise going to be? I just want to point out that I ran a competition um, with three families where we did exome and genome sequencing. And I got the Children's Hospital to put out a $25,000 prize. And we had 30 academic, 30 international entrants. The backstory of this, which you can get off the web, is that we were trying to standardize the clinical cold genome, uh, clinical grade sequencing. What was amazing is these kids who have been seen inside our hospitals without a diagnosis. Seven of the teams actually converged on the diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis of two of them in three months after years of being without a diagnosis in our own hospital system. And it's the nature of those multidisciplinary teams out there including in our hospitals, who normally would not part, take part in clinical care. It may have happened. So here's one kid, for example, the mother, after uh, many years of not having a diagnosis, for the symptomatic diagnosis of uh, central nuclear myopathy, actually gave him this birthday cake with the name of Jean. So happens, unfortunately, she has a, uh, she's a heterozygous, so she's at all that, actually, at risk of heart disease. But the point is, we actually developed that expertise. It's not clear to me that expertise is in the health system. With that, thank you very much.